Linda was the first Aboriginal person to serve in the New South Wales Parliament. That was 17 years ago, so about three years after that march. And the first Aboriginal woman elected to the House of Reps in Canberra. And during this Reconciliation Week, she's on the line. Linda, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Richard. How are you? Good. Can we talk first a little bit about self-confidence and how you get the self-confidence to be the leader you are, given the racist communities you grew up in, which normally, understandably, would knock someone's confidence for six. How did you, how did your survive, I guess, is my question. Well, I think that's something that's very difficult to answer. It's got a lot to do with um, my personality, I think, but also... I was raised by my great aunt and uncle who were born, believe it or not, in the 1890s. They were non-Aboriginal people. And growing up in a very small country town, um, you know, born out of wedlock and being an Aboriginal person and my mother being a white person certainly put steel in your backbone. Um, And I also... I was raised by my great great aunt and uncle in really old-fashioned values of decency and honesty and respect, but also I had to be very self-reliant. I mean, by the time I was 13 or 14, they were very old and the roles kind of reversed. And I've always had to take a fair bit of control of my own life. I've made lots of my own decisions. And I also was raised not to have self-doubt. And I, I, don't, I don't say that I haven't got any, but I don't have a lot of it. So uh, people from the 1890s, so by the time you're 13, how, how old are they? Uh, they were in their 70s. So they were in their... I was born in 1957, and they were in their mid to late 60s when they, um, they uh, took on me to raise as a as a baby um, and incredibly brave thing to do uh, in that time and when, when you think about the attitudes and the views and two non-Aboriginal people, a brother and a sister, never married, uh, that had come through World War I, World War II and the Depression, uh, taking on a little Aboriginal girl in a country town in the 50s was an incredibly brave thing to do and I'm terribly grateful to them. And when you say you were brought up with with their kind of traditional values, can you summarise those values? What what were they? What were the things that they instilled in you? Uh, You never, ever put your back to anyone. Uh, You never spoke when someone else was speaking. You didn't sweep after dark (laughs) Uh, because that pulled up the spirits apparently. Um, But also really values of respect and... uh, um, and showing respect uh, and work, a very strong work ethic um, and also that there is a great deal to be made from grace and, um, and uh, humbleness. Mm. And they were a brother and sister, you say, so they, they, neither of them had married but they, they sort of formed a household and, and, and yes. brought you up in it. Really incredible. Um, they were uh, brother and sister um, uh, Billy was older than Nina, my, uh, my auntie, my great auntie. Um, and for some reason they, they never married, um, but they, they loved me very dearly and, uh, brought me up very well. Mm. Now you, you met your, you didn't meet your, your, um, biological father until 19, 1984. That's correct. Uh, So that was an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, moment in my life and a very important moment in my life. Uh, I had grown up, you know, always feeling like a jigsaw puzzle with a piece missing. And that piece was my father, of course. And I met him uh, on, on the 18th of April, 1984. And my son was born on the 19th of April, 1984. And I'm sure it was due to the emotions. He came a little bit early. I met my dad and he's, he um, 
discovered I had 10 brothers and sisters that I didn't know existed. We grew up 40 minutes apart and such, were, such was the power of, of raci racism and um, exclusion in those days. But uh, he got into the back of the car where I was sitting with some other people. I showed him a photograph of my mother about, about the age he would have um, known her and I said, I think you're my father. And uh, after about a minute, he just put his arms around me and said, I hope I don't disappoint you. Oh, and of course, I hope I don't did. disappoint you. <laughs> oh, God. But, you oh, know, God. the thing is, for, for Aboriginal people, this is not an unusual experience. There's so many of our people that, uh, you know, that, were, that grew up under the stolen generations and somehow or other a place was always kept and I was made to feel welcome and, uh, and there, there just wasn't the angst that perhaps some people would think that would go with that. It was a truly remarkable moment in my life and, and made me a complete person. Mm. Linda, Linda Burney is, is with us. I wonder if it's because you were pregnant that you reached out to the father. I mean, that's what often happens. It's only when you become a parent yourself you, you kind of get how important they are. <laughs> well, I'd been um, searching for my uh, Aboriginal heritage and my family for about five years, uh, writing letters to people. I remember I wrote to one uh, woman who, was in an, who probably was in the hospital at about, about the same time I was born, um, having her son, and she said, you don't need to know all that, those things. You've done well, leave it alone. And that just typifies, doesn't it, sort of the, um, not, a, not a cruel attitude, but a view that um, somehow or other um, I was best not knowing these things. And for me, of course, that was, not, that was not at all the way it is. And Aboriginality is about connection to country, about uh, your kinship ties, and about understanding where you come from. Mm, and yet they're just the things. I mean, we talked to, to Link Up yesterday, a uh, great young guy from there. But, you know, this is just what's been denied, exactly that, the knowledge of country, the knowledge of relatives to, well, he says tens of thousands of Indigenous people apply under that, have applied under that program over the last few years. Uh, that's absolutely right. And Link Up, Richard, is just a marvellous organisation um, run on the smell of an oily rag, but the... The amount of people they've connected to their family, um, often to parents who are no longer there and it's visiting a grave, and, but getting to know your cousins and your uh, extended family is just very, very, very important. Linda Burney is here. What was it like for you? The father, obviously, a very intense experience, but then ten siblings, ten brothers and sisters. Yes, and I'm the oldest of them. Um, and I've met um, all, of, all of my ten brothers and sisters. On my mum's side, there were uh, two brothers and two sisters uh, as well. So <laughs> altogether, it's a very large family. Mm. When you say it made you feel complete, tell, tell me more about that, what, what, what changed in you. Because you obviously had this great personal strength before that, before that moment, uh, as you say, taught to you by those... those those, uh, stand, those stand in parents? Um, well, it's the, the, the way that I can describe it is, um, and I think this is very much uh, a feeling that many children and young people have that, uh, that don't know their, their, their parents. It's, it's, and I was Minister for Community Services in New South Wales, as you know, Richard, for some time. And at the end of the day, uh, you want to know as a human being where you come from. You want to know what's made you. And those things are, are very human things. But for Aboriginal people, it's, it's, it's also, as, as we've just discussed, it's knowing uh, what country you're from, um, whether you're a Rajri. Uh, it's knowing uh, what, what has made... Um, and what the story of, of that family is and uh, where you fit into the Aboriginal story of this country. And that's really important. It's a very, very 
crucial part of identity and identity um, is something that is so important for First Nations people. Mm. Now, for you, the, the country, both the country you were brought up in, and you, you said that the, the father, et cetera, was, was quite close. So this was around Leeton, right? Yes. Um, I think you've got a place in Wiradjuri country as well. Is that right? Well, Wombian Caves. Is that Wiradjuri country? I don't know, actually. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. So uh, the, 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 I mean, I think one of the remarkable things that's happened in Australia is that it is now very normal uh, that people know not only that they're from near Leeton, but they also know what the Aboriginal uh, nation of that area is. And with acknowledgement of country and recognition of country, uh, that is something that's becoming a very regular part of Australian social life. And Le I was from a little tiny country town called Witten, uh, which is in uh, southwestern New South Wales, right in Wiradjuri Territory, down on the Murrumbidgee, and very close, sort of halfway between Leeton and Griffith, really. And when you go back there, you feel you still feel, feel the pull of it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I know that uh, even driving to Canberra, when you get around Goulburn, you think, ah, oh, we're Adjury Territory. <laughs> when you get over that mountain, um, Lithgow going down into Bathurst, we're Adjury Territory. Uh, when you go down towards the Riverina, uh, you know you are driving through Wiradjuri country. And there are very poignant parts of that. I mean, just uh, outside of, of, uh, of Leeton, uh, on the way to... Um, I think it's on the way to... Uh, 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 Wagga, uh, you drive over a creek which is called Poison Waterhole Creek. Uh, you drive on the back road between Griffith and Darlington Point. You you cross a bridge that's called Murdering Island, and you know the story of why, and you understand why those place names are there. And of course, Richard, they are massacre sites, and this is the shared truth telling that I talk about, that many people talk about because it's not just the story of uh, Aboriginal Australia, it is a shared history. It's not apportioning guilt, um, it's not, nothing about that, but it's recognising that these things happened um, on country that we now share. Which brings us to this week, to Reconciliation Week. That, that bridge march I, I mentioned 20 years ago, 300,000 people went on it. Uh, it, it wasn't, uh, as I say, <laughs> sorry? 350,000. 350,000, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, 350,000. It was a it was a kind of protest, but that was not the feel of it. It was a really yeah. joyous occasion where everyone expected uh, suddenly the sun, the sky would uh, the sky would always be blue and that things would change. How do you rate what's happened since then? Because you were one of the organisers of that thing. I, I was one of the organisers, and I just can't believe, Richard, that it's 20, 20 years. I remember that day. It's probably one of the most remarkable days of of my life, and i said a couple of times, we were... We were it, remember there was... Um, it was actually the whole weekend. It was called Corroboree 2000. It was the formal end of the reconciliation process in Australia. Uh, the politics were difficult because the Prime Minister of the day, Mr Howard, um, had refused to say sorry. Um, and many, uh, many of his Cabinet colleagues actually walked across the bridge... Uh, but, you know, we, 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 we organised to have the bridge open for three hours, Richard, um, and we had to keep it open for five hours because so many people um, turned up. And I, I actually put the success of that day down to the fact that it was a tangible thing that people could do to demonstrate that they were, um, they were supportive of the reconciliation process in Australia. Uh, where, where have we got to? I have um, mixed feelings. I think that we've made enormous strides in some areas, but some of the really um, social justice issues and the level of poverty um, hasn't changed very much. In fact, some of them have gone backwards. And you'll remember also, Richard, there was the 
uh, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there are now more people in jail than there was in, th in that period. And there are more Aboriginal children in care than there was removed through the stolen generations. There are diseases within the Aboriginal community, rheumatic heart disease, for example, that don't exist in the, in the broader community. So some of those really hard social justice issues have not changed. And we can't say that we're a reconciled nation until we have social justice. Ken White, your opposite, is, is consulting to try to get this Indigenous First Nations voice to Parliament organised. There does seem to be this issue about whether that voice is in the Constitution or simply we, we acknowledge the importance of, of Indigenous people in the Constitution and leave that mechanism to normal parliamentary you know, determination. Is that that important for you? It's really important. Um, the Labor Party... Um, you're, I'm sure you're aware, supports the Uluru Statement in its entirety. Um, and very quickly, that's an entrenched voice to the Parliament. Um, it's a Makarata Commission that would be responsible for agreement and treaty-making and a national truth-telling process. Uh, where things are at in terms of uh, the voice is that the Prime Minister has said that he is not prepared to have a referendum on enshrining a voice in the Constitution. He has said that he's prepared to have, or that he said yesterday at the press club, uh, that the issue of constitutional recognition of First Peoples is still on the table. Well, my, my, my message, if that is still on the table, make it clear, because we are running out of time in this parliamentary uh, sitting to achieve a referendum, which either way um, the government decides to go will require a referendum. Uh, but certainly the party that I represent is in favour, absolutely, of an entrenched voice in the Constitution mm. to the Parliament. But, you know, the trouble is uh, you, no one no one on either, any side of politics, I, I think, wants a, a referendum which is lost. We want a referendum which is going to go ahead with a great sense of certainty that the Australian people yes. are going to vote for it. If, if there was a referendum which said, which acknowledged the importance and centrality of, of Indigenous people but left out the voice and yet the voice was, was achieved, uh, an institution was set up which delivered that voice to Parliament, uh, would, that, would that be a compromise where you would... I think there'd be confidence that you'd get it passed and in practice the voice would be there. Um, look, that's, that's the $64,000 question and I'm not trying to squib it. I'm just, I'm just saying that Labor's position at the moment is, is what I've articulated. And we have also said, Richard, that we'll be informed by the co-design process, which is what um, Ken Wyatt has put in place. So there is a watching brief on this particular uh, space, but we have to come to some resolution, in my view, in the next six months if we're going to achieve referendum change. I mean, if the referendum is going to be a standalone referendum, you would not do it in the same year that there's a general election, which is 2022. So time is of the essence. Mm. Yeah, it... Uh... It sure is. It's been a long 20 years since uh, you and others organised that glorious day on the Harbour Bridge. Uh, Linda, it's, it's, uh, I think Wombin Caves is Gundagurra country. Oh, I, I, Gundagurra. I've, yes, it is too. Gun You're absolutely yeah. right. It took, it took me a while to bring it to the front of my mind where, yeah, as you say, it should... But neighbours to a Rajari. It should always be at front of mind. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, happy Reconciliation Day. And, uh, you too, Richard. You know, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. Bye. There's Linda Burney, member for Barton, Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, first uh, Indigenous person in the New South Wales Parliament. That was only 17 years ago. You'd think there would be an Indigenous person before that, wouldn't you, in the long history of the New South Wales Parliament, one that goes back before Federation. Uh, but she was it, and then uh, the first woman in the House of Reps in Canberra. And that incredibly uh, intense and, and moving story about being brought up by this brave brother and sister aunt in their 70s when she was a teenager, but she still... Uh, gives them the credit for the, the values and strength of character which have made her such a, a leader in this country. It